Welcome, welcome, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining our virtual artist talk here at the Crucible. Well, not physically here at the Crucible, but definitely in spirit. My name is Alyssa Stone. I am the Director of Programs at the Crucible, and we're so excited that you have decided to join us on this lovely Friday afternoon. Hope you are all doing well and are safe. Um, we do these artist talks every Friday at three o'clock, so please tune in towards the very end when you'll get to learn uh, who our next artist is um, next Friday, and thank you for joining us. Um, if you are back for another artist talk, we are excited to see you again. Um, we welcome you to pop over into the chat function and give us a little hello and tell us where you're watching from today. So give us a hello, tell us where you're watching from, um, and if you have any questions that you'd like to ask to our artists, you can pop them over in the chat box as well. Um, I, in case you don't know about The Crucible yet, I'm going to tell you a little bit. Uh, the Crucible is a nonprofit 501c3 organization. Since 1999, The Crucible has been an important cultural arts organization and community in the Bay Area. We serve more than 5,000 students every year, work with over 45 local schools, offering classes, workshops, and site visits, and have the pleasure of introducing so many students to the transformative power and confidence building uh, power of art making. Over 20,000 people each year interact with our classes and programs, with 64% of the young people we serve receiving financial aid to participate. For many, the Crucible is the industrial arts school in the Bay Area, known for high quality teaching and a vibrant artist community. However, since COVID-19 erupted in our area, the Crucible has had to cancel or postpone more than 230 classes and programs. We are working to bring some of the magic of the Crucible online, including this talk today, featuring Rosa Durantes, our department head for ceramics. We are sad to be closed, but we're excited to be connecting uh, in our, with our community in new ways and getting to sit down with Rosa. We are going to get through this, and we are asking our community to support us by becoming a member, purchasing a gift certificate, donating directly, or buying art directly from our faculty. I know some of our faculty are watching right now, uh, including one of our glass flameworking faculty, Janet, whose piece I'm wearing today. Thank you, Janet, for this gorgeous piece. Um, we have on our website a variety of our faculty and artists' works up for sale. We are currently in a match campaign. Up to $50,000 in donations is being matched now all the way through May 8th. If you're able to contribute, visit our website, thecrucible.org, and help us with a matching donation. Every dollar is doubled all the way through May 8th, up to $50,000. Uh, so say hello to us and tell us where you're watching from in the chat box. We encourage you throughout the talk to send questions you have for Rosa to us privately or in the public chat, and I'll go ahead and ask them towards the end of our talk today. We are going to keep our guests on mute all the way until the end, but if you'd like to stick around after the official talk, we are going to do a little artist after hours where you are welcome to unmute after our official talk ends and get to say hello to Rosa. I want to say a few thank yous to those who helped to make these virtual artist talks possible. A big thank you to our executive director, Susan Murnett, who has been an awesome leader for us as we navigate this uh, crazy situation of coronavirus. A big thank you to our marketing duo, Natasha Von Canel, director of marketing and e-commerce, and Kathy Nyland, our marketing associate, who have helped to make these talks possible. A shout out to Renee Ventimiglia, our CFO, and Kua Patton, our Director of Operations and Facilities, for helping to make sure that everything runs smoothly over at the Crucible. And a big thank you to all of our staff and faculty. We could not do what we do without our entire community of faculty, artists, and staff. So we are so grateful to all of them and cannot wait to get back into the studios at the Crucible. So today we are talking with Rosa Durantes. I want to note uh, before we get started, during this talk we'll be discussing parts of the body and pieces that engage with explicit language at times, 
parents and families should decide if they're comfortable participating in this talk today. A little bit about Rosa. Crucible Ceramics Department Head Rosa Durantes has been working in ceramics for more than two decades. Her first introduction was in the seventh grade art class uh, that she took with an influential, influential teacher and she was hooked. Durantes was born and raised in Oakland um, to a mother and father who immigrated from Nicaragua and Mexico, respectively. Much of her work reflects themes of womanhood, personal experience, and family. As the ceramics department head, Rosa has made it her mission to create a safe and welcoming space for students, fostering freedom to experiment and explore ideas. Please join me in a warm virtual welcome to Rosa Durantes. Hello. Hi, thank you for having me. Rosa, welcome and thank you so much for joining us for our talk today. I'm so excited to get to chat with you. Thank you. Uh, let's jump in and talk a little bit about your early experience in ceramics. How were you first introduced to ceramics and can you tell us about one of your most memorable early projects? Yeah, definitely. So, um, like you mentioned before, my um, what really got me into ceramics was my seventh grade art teacher. So uh, I took art 101 with her in middle school and as I was finishing up middle school, she went ahead and transferred to my high school and started up the ceramics program there. So when I got in um, as a freshman, she had already had this program going and when I recognized her, I was like, yes, like of course it's Miss Hope, I'm gonna take her class. And so like once I took her class and like I got to like touch the material, like I just really, fell in love with it and uh, continued to take ceramics all the way until graduation. Um, one of the most memorable pieces I made was this like hand-built um, ceramic fan that I made, like, you know, fan yourself. Um, it was like a Chinese type of fan and um, it was featured, like it got to be featured at our local mall in this like art show that was for all these like high school students in the area. So for me, it was just so exciting to have like my piece in this like communal space and to be recognized for it. And I just, I never forgot the experience. Tell us about how your ceramics teacher from middle and high school impacted your career. Oh gosh, she, um, she was such like this wonderful eccentric spirit that just really like encouraged us to try anything. Um, she was very much like female empowering like she, her favorite artist was Frida Kahlo and she was very much this like um like a free spirit type of person um she was a self-proclaimed hippie but like she was just so encouraging so supportive of our interests and like she um encouraged us to like keep taking ceramics classes like she took um she created an advanced ceramics course for us um we, I was her TA. And so like, without her, like I wouldn't have had so much influence and so much immersion in ceramics. So like, I, I need to find her and thank her for all this because it's, she single-handedly led me down this path and I'm so grateful. You received your degree in studio art with an emphasis in ceramics from San Francisco State. What was an important turning point when you knew you wanted to become a professional artist? Um, well, I would say like I kind of knew, I didn't know I wanted to be a professional art. Well, yes, I didn't know I wanted to be an artist, but I would say that happened um, before starting university. Um, I was in the workplace and so after graduating high school, I didn't go straight into college. Like I went straight into work. Um, into the workforce and so I think by having those experiences it led me to be like no I need to do something in the arts like this is what's it was what called to me and so like um, it just helped me like get to to like move forward and like my goodness <laughs> like I just had to like um, it just really helped me like oh my goodness I'm so sorry I just blanked out right now <laughs> um, sorry, can you repeat the question again? Sure. We, uh, we know that your first, your earlier experiences in art were in middle and high school. Oh, and you yeah. decided to 
to, to continue pursuing a, a degree from San Francisco State. Yes. How did you know? What was the turning point when you wanted to become a professional artist? Well, it was just like I I wanted to do something in, in ceramics. And like after going into like community college, and that's where I realized I wanted to do ceramics. Um, it was there that I got like that focus, and so I like my my vision kind of really like narrowed and it was just all ceramics all the time and it was just like really i think once i got into college and like touched clay again after so many years that's when it clicked like this is what i wanted to do and that's when i realized like that's when i wanted to be like a teacher and just show all this stuff and really share like what i've learned and really just like fall in love with the material. That's what I really just wanted to do. Well, you definitely love the material that you work in and so many people love to see your pieces. They're absolutely extraordinary. Um, yes. You've got a few behind you. You've got a little uh, show off shelf there. Um, let's dive into a couple of the pieces that we saw in the slideshow at the beginning. Um, in particular, we've all been struck by the design and glaze of the teapot. Would you tell us a little bit about the process in making this piece? What sure. was the intention behind it? Um, so this piece was um, made in college and I was very much like into experimenting everything and trying out all these like different techniques. So um, this was where I rolled out a slab of clay and then um, poured different types of slip onto it. So these are colored slips and what slip really is, is clay mixed with water. So I actually have some here if you want to see, like hopefully you can see all that, but like this is just like um, a water, a solution of water mixed with clay to make it a little more like a glue or really just like just tends to flow. And so there was colorants mixed into that and poured over this. And I used like a tool to create a swirl and gravity like to make the, the slip move. And so once that, that slab set, um, I found this lady in there and like she became like the pinpoint of this piece. And because my work is so like female like empowerment and themed around the feminine figure, like I had to put it on here and the rest of the piece was made to kind of like mimic the organic flow and have this like natural look to it. Um, and then this piece was also like placed into a soda fire kiln. And so it's a special kiln that um, is usually outside and it's a gas kiln. And at the peak temperature, there's a solution of baking soda and water that's sprayed into the kiln. And so that baking soda and water vaporizes and forms like a mist. And then that kind of floats all over the kiln, landing on the piece. And it gives us this like a special kind of texture. It's, I don't know, it's kind of a little difficult to see, but it's like a bit of like this orange kill texture that's really beautiful. And it gives it like a very unique glazed appearance on here. Um, so it's definitely like one of my favorites and it has this very unique, um, there's colorants in here. There's um, cop blue, copper carbonate, sorry, cobalt carbonate, um, rutile, and um, some other kind of color in here. Teapots play a really prominent place, a role in your artistry development. Um, what is it about teapots that you're so drawn to? I think, well, at first it was about like, like mastering the technique of like making the perfect inset and the spout to like pour correctly. But then over time, I realized that I really enjoyed making these because like they were vessels and it's meant to like nurture and like, like hold comfort. And that's how I feel like a lot. I want my pieces to kind of have this like feeling of that embrace. It's like also part tied into that like whole feminine theme of just like kind of like I don't know, it's just like there's something about my pieces that I just really want you to kind of like hold them and almost like give them like a bit of a hug. Um, and that's just like how I want my pieces to feel. And I think the teapot really kind of translates that. Jumping a little bit to your classes, which I have had the pleasure of getting to watch since I started at the, cru at the Crucible. One of the things students rave about in your classes is your passion and willingness to experiment. Why, as a medium, does ceramics lend itself so well to experimentation? 
I mean, everything about it is just wonderful. <laughs> like, it's just like, um, it really helps you just like, you can do so much to it. You can be so like forceful or delicate. And I really like, um, it's just so tangible and it's in your hands and you can really like, all you have to do is just follow those small like rules that ceramics has and beyond that you can do anything. So like, I really feel like you can just experiment. Like, I think it just allows you to have, like, let your imagination go. You can ask, what does this do? What does that do? And if so long as it doesn't break those small rules, like why not try it? Like I love, I mean, we have thousands of years of like trying things in ceramics and then we get all, we discover all these new things and new techniques and new styles. And that wouldn't have been done if it wasn't been for experimenting and trying new things. So it's just, I really, really try to like encourage that in my students because it's just, I think of like the way we're the way we're set up to like think and like feel like we're not really um, allowed to feel failure. And in ceramics, like it's okay to fail. Like it's okay to try new things because if it fails, it's okay. If it breaks, it's okay. You can try it again. You should try something else. Um, and I really, really try to like incorporate that into my classes. Can you give an example or remember a time when a student experiment in one of your classes inspired you and excited you to try something new? Yeah, actually, um, I get inspired by my students all the time. Like, I'll even make a new piece, like, almost every semester that's, like, kind of inspired by them. But um, I would say, like, going back to the cactus, the idea of the cactus was inspired by one of my students. Um, like we had a student who had a piece and she carved the cactus at home because she wanted to make like a little succulent planter. And once I saw that little cactus, I was like, oh, it reminded me of my cactus at home. And then it triggered all those memories about Oakland and having that original one that was in my garden, like came all the way from Oakland. And so that was one of my biggest inspirations. Like and that came from a student. So it's just, I mean, it's awesome. I love being around, you know, my students because they just come up with all these new ideas. It's not me coming up with them, and but I get inspired by them, and then they'll get inspired by me, and sometimes they'll even be like almost like a cycle. It's, it's amazing. I have always felt like for the ceramics department, more than many of our other departments at the Crucible, we have all these repeat students. Uh, they are so excited to jump back into ceramics classes um, and, and inspire each other and be inspired by you and Phoebe, one of your co-teachers. Um, what do you think that it is that brings students back to your classes? Um, well, like, I really just try to, like, for me, I definitely try to make the food studio, like, feel like home like a place that you can just come and like relax and just de-stress and I, I I just think it's really fun to have like music on <laughs> and it's one of those few studios that has music in, in at the crucible so like there'll be people like working at a table like five to a table and they'll be in a circle and you just see like some of them just start to jam move around or like when we'll start like singing the lyrics under their breath. And then that kind of, I feel like almost it's like an icebreaker. It'll kind of help like, you know, just let them like relax and like be more willing to talk to each other. Or they'll have like one project, somebody can be like really excited and take their project into like this new direction and someone will see it and get really excited. And I think it's just having that like communal area and just the, the environment that I try to create, which is like a home and just relaxing. Um, I think that really, I don't know, the students really like it and they keep coming back. Uh, I definitely consider the ceramics department a sanctuary and I know many, many other students do as well. How has teaching and leading your department influenced your work or working process? Um, it's definitely influenced my working process. Like, I feel my work, I try to like have my work um, a little more like cohesive. Like 
before I used to make work that was just like for myself and it, and it was like my personal meaning and if, if somebody didn't understand it or didn't like connect with it like whatever but now like I have work that I kind of want to like show to my students or like try new techniques but like I want there to be like a concept or an idea that translates more readily to like a general audience and having students like really helped me like wrap my mind around that concept. Um, and I feel like it's really helped influence my work to be like more like connecting to the audience. And um, so that's been really, really like, I feel like it's really helped me a lot and I've grown a lot in that sense. Um, and as a side benefit too, is like I work a little more faster now. So like from having demonstrations and having to show things like I don't want to spend like half an hour making like a little pinch pot. I, I want to go a little more fast, but I move with purpose and with direction. And um, I didn't have that before. And it's been after like all this like a couple of years of teaching now that it's really like I've, I've honed that skill and it's really like sped up my work, but in a more like in a, in a stronger direction might even be that some of that speed helps to remove some of the self-judgment, right? And, and just yeah. kind of going for it. It really does. Like, it's like letting go of that, like, fear. and just like more of like going with your gut. Like, okay, like, you know, don't think, don't overthink it. It's just like, this feels right, go with it. Um, and that's really, it's, it's really helped me push myself. What has been a great challenge in your ceramics development and, and what challenges you still today in ceramics making? Oh gosh, I feel like it just, it never ends. Um, I'm still, I think I still am challenged into like, um, I wanna make work that is still like more meaningful and thoughtful. Um, like a lot of my work is very much like, translated by how I feel in that moment. But now like I'm trying to um, make work that has like a deeper meaning to it and has like a more like of a stronger concept. Um, and I, I wanna like treat myself a little more like a professional artist now. Like now that it's been several years and I feel like I've honed my skill, but now it's really more about like letting go of the fear and expressing my ideas in a stronger um, structured way. I'd love to ask you about another piece that you're interested in sharing. And so while you're kind of thinking about which piece that you would like to sh uh, share about, I'd love to invite our participants to drop any questions they would like to ask Rosa into the chat box. If you've got a question you would like Rosa um, to think about and, and talk about today, go ahead and add that into the chat box. And I'll go ahead and I'll ask that towards the end of our time together. Um, and jumping back to some of your work, Rosa, which really is so stunning, is there another piece that you would be willing to share with us and tell us a little bit about the technique in making it? Um, let's see. Well, my goodness. I have techniques. Well, um, I've been working on some projects at home here. Um, I've been very fortunate to like, I've got to go to the crucible and grab some clay. Um, and I have this project that I'm working on is um, just reflective of what's going on right now. So like I've been rolling out these like slabs of clay and just um, making these like mats out of clay. And so I've been thinking about like um, the shortages that we have, you know, like we're short on masks and so like and like we have all these professional healthcare workers that don't have them and need them. And so like, I just have felt the need to say something about that. And so like, I'm thinking about making multitudes of these and putting them together in some sort of installation. And there's still like, I still need to hone the idea. And so like, that's, which is what I've been working on is like developing like a deeper concept that is, that translates to everybody. 
Just last week in our artist talk with Karen Smith, we were talking about masks and how they play such a prevalent role in pretty much all art practice across cultures um, and how masks in art may change just based on this situation as you know, a, a functional thing and not just a art visage um, piece. So I can't wait to see how that piece turns out. And we'll talk a little bit more about your vision for that um, coming up. Um, thank you to those who are adding some questions to our chat box. Um, I'd love to think a little bit about art making now. Um, now that we are in week five of the shelter in place, can you tell us a little bit about your creative process? How has creating in sh uh, during shelter in place been for you? Um, it's been a challenge, but not like impossible since I was very fortunate enough to like grab all these materials. So I grabbed some clay, I grabbed some tools. Um, I managed to um, borrow a little kiln. So I'm still able to make here at home, but it's definitely um, different because it's outside. Um, and I feel like it's a different mindset from versus like being in the studio. I think um, when I'm in the studio, it's like ceramics immersion. And here, there's a little bit more distraction. Um, there's like neighbors and noise in the community um, and, and family. But um, I feel like it makes the moment that I am out here outside, like it just makes it feel so much more enriching. Um, it makes me so much more grateful to have this. And I know like a lot of um, artists aren't able to work at home. Um, so I feel very, very fortunate to have this. Um, and it's been a little challenging because there's like no running water, but you know, it make it work and it's not impossible to do so. And so like, um, it's, it's been going slowly and I really just, um, really looking forward to getting back into the studio. <laughs> like I miss it so much. I think we are all missing being in the studios and being at the crucible right now. And I'm sure that our ceramic students are truly missing their time um, with Clay and, and with you. Um, so you had mentioned a little bit earlier, uh, cacti, they play a really prominent role in your life and in your work. Yeah. Um, could you tell us about the background there, what what first kind of got you hooked on cactus as a, a symbol, as a medium um, to, to emulate? And what were the origins of that? Um, well, I think it's the cactus is just, for me, it's been so prevalent in my life um, because I grew up around it, you know? And so like, it's been it's always been around it's been uh it's something that's very common in i think mexican culture um and it's just been so like common around here like it grows in the wild it grows out you know like out in the sidewalks off the streets and um like it, we've eaten it my whole life like i've eaten the fruit and the vegetable and just preparing it in like home cooking um and it's just for me, I think it's, it resonates with me because it like, it's very resilient and it's been around, you know, especially my particular cacti that's been around like my whole life. And um, for me, it just like symbolizes like that resilience in like the family because like it reminds me of my parents and how they grew up together. Um, and like, I just, I get inspired by them all the time. Like I made a little cactus here this is one of my first pieces when I got here into in my home studio. And so like, I don't know, it's just, I really enjoy it. And there's something that it just, it gives me a lot of pleasure just to, to make them. Um, it's fun to like, I, I just, yeah, no, they're just, they're just like really special to me. They're, I just, I love them. Um, and I think they're just really like fun to draw as well. Like I've been doing it everywhere, like all the time. I get inspired by them all the time. Um. When we were talking um, about the cactus earlier, one of the things that I was really struck by is how it's followed you from place to place, almost like it is the mark that you are home. Um, yeah. Could you tell us about that first 
cactus cutting? Sure, yeah. Um, so, well, we had that big ass cactus plant over in my uh, our home in Oakland. So we had this huge yard. And so the cutting that my mom took with us, um, she put it into like, we had moved in with my cousin. And so we lived with her for a while. And so um, I remember like planting that, that cactus and it took a couple of years to like really start producing fruit and grow in height. And for me, one of like one of my favorite memories is actually like eating the fruit from it um, called prickly pear in English, right? And so in Spanish, it's called tuna. Um, and so like my mom, like those are one of my favorite fruits when I was a child. Um, we used to eat those all the time in the summer and just, yeah, they're, they're great. <laughs> um, no, they're, um, what else about cactus? So they've, I mean, our first cutting, we've had to like, it's just a very resilient plant as well. And so we've had to cut back on that cactus all the time. Like I had to uh, cut our trim our cactus down here. Um, you had shown us some of those masks that you've been working on now, which is so present and continuing on. Are you finding yourself drawn to other symbols during this challenging time um, that, that you're creating in clay? Um, you know, to me, what I think about is coronavirus seems so flimsy. I'm, I constantly joke that it's this weak little germ, um, but clay is very strong. Um, it is a, a more permanent art form. Um, what is it about clay, that medium, that's helping you think about this contemporary situation? Um, it's been making me think about like how permanent it is and how like our, our, like this won't decompose or break down, but I've been thinking a lot about the waste that has been, um, been created by all these products, like our sanitizing products, um, like sanitizing, like empty sanitizer bottles, all the masks that have to get thrown away, all that waste that gets produced. And so I've been thinking about like what to say about that. And um, I've been thinking about like collecting these like empty hand sanitizer bottles and like making um, plaster molds out of them and start casting multitudes of those sanitizer bottles um, in clay. And just to show like how, you know, all the waste that's produced and, and it's just kind of like a, like reflecting on all that plastic waste that is just getting accumulating from all those plastic bottles. And I don't know, I feel like it's just important to say something about that in clay and it's just like the opposite of what is so disposable is very permanent. And I think there's something interesting in that juxtaposition. I can't wait to see what that project develops into. I think it's so interesting. And um, the juxtaposition, like you were saying about permanence and impermanence, I think is really powerful um, yeah. during this time. Yeah. Um, you are having an opportunity to get to continue creating even during this shelter in place. Um, and you mentioned not all artists have that opportunity. What suggestions do you have for artists who might be feeling stuck or distracted in their practice? Um, I would suggest like, since it is very difficult for artists to create right now, I would say um, just reflect, like allow yourself to reflect. Um, think about, I mean, think about how this has impacted your life. And I know like for a lot, like a lot of artists, like I'm already thinking how there's life before COVID-19 and life after COVID-19. So like, I think it's just like a good time to think about like what, where has your art taken you for in the past? And now where is it gonna take you in the future? So it's just a really good time to think about like your work, what you wanna make, um, what do you want to say about it and just reflect reflect on your life and, and your art. Thank you for that. What has been a surprising discovery during this time of shelter in place in the Bay Area for you? Um, for me, it's been really 
um, surprising how like while like it's really it this what's going on is like all about like we have to be like social distance right we have to stay away from each other but in a sense I feel like it's also pulled the community together like I feel like it's pulled our community so like together like we're going through this together and we're gonna get through it together and I feel like that in the sense like it's just kind of like just bringing us in closer and that not only do I feel like this is happening at the crucible it's also happening in my community like I live in a very tight-knit community like it's very it's a trailer park so like we're literally like in very 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 small spaces and so like while we're trying to stay away from each other at the same time the community has grown stronger like people are checking in on each other and making sure that you know somebody has what they need and so um I think that's just like one of the like actual like a benefit of of what's going on right now mm, thank you for sharing that yeah i am excited now to start asking some of the questions that our audience has posed for you um if you have additional questions friends out there please definitely pop them into the chat box and i'll try to answer uh i won't answer them i'll try to ask them for rosa to answer um but let's get ourselves started um our first question is about the teapot. Has the teapot ever been exhibited or put up for sale? It's beautiful and the way um, it came about is amazing. Why is it that it hasn't sold? <laughs> um, well, it was featured in the gallery show in college, like when it was made. Um, I want to say this was made 2014. Um, I, it's just like it's only been featured but I think there's just um, there's always been a fear about selling my work that I've always had this like strange mindset that my work isn't good enough so up until now <laughs> like everything I would make like it, if it doesn't get like given away or sold to people that I know it goes into a box and so um, this teapot has just been in a box for years um, and I love it so, so like I think sometimes I get like emotionally attached to them pieces and it's like hard to let go, but I need to let go because I'm running out of space. <laughs> like I have like literally stacks of boxes and, and I, I, I cannot bring more stuff home. I have to let go. I think your pieces are fantastic and there definitely be an audience for them. So um, I think that you should go for it and put them up for people. Um, <laughs> you got to let it go. Exactly. Yep. Um, we might jump back to some of your other pieces that you've got behind you in a, a, a moment. Um, we have another audience question. When you are making your creations, what part of the process do you find most satisfying? Shaping the clay, glazing, or after the firing and you have completed something? Oh my gosh, I can tell you hands down, my favorite part is the making. Like the very beginning of just like sinking my teeth into the clay. Oh, it's the best. Like I really enjoy the feeling of manipulating the clay under my hands. Um, for me, that is the funnest part. And it's, for me, the most liberating and freeing because I can just do whatever I want to it and just like poke at it and mess with it. And I really enjoy just like my hands on the work. Um, after it gets fired, I like it a little less. <laughs> I like it a little less. And the glazing part is my least favorite part. It's, it's mentally, it's like pulling teeth to get started. But once I get started, I get into it and it's fine. But um, for me, it's hands down. It's just making, 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 making. You like to get your fingers sunk into the clay. Love it, love it. Um, we have a question about collaboration. Um, have you ever considered collaborating on some of your pieces and, and works? No, but I'd love to. That sounds like so much fun. That would, that sounds like great time <laughs> uh any artists out there if you're interested in collaborating uh, with rosa on a piece definitely get in contact with sure. her i think she's into it yeah um, <laughs> do you listen to different music or different types uh, for different types of projects or project phases 
No, I listen to like one type of music, <laughs> which is like electronic music. So like EDM, like anything with the beat is is for me. Like I have to have something that has like a thump, bass, and a hit, and I just go go go. And like I remember, like in like my people, like I'll be on the wheel and like bobbing my head and go to the rhythm, and you have to stay absolutely still. And I've had people call me out for that. Like, why are you dancing while throwing? And I'm like, yeah, you gotta feel the beat. Feel it. <laughs> that is all me, like EDM all the time. Do you feel like the music influences your work? Um, I, no, not necessarily. I would say it helps me get into like that, men, like that headspace of making. Um, sometimes, maybe, I mean, I just really feel like it just kind of kind of gets me into that rhythm and the flow, the music itself. Um, I have been inspired by some songs like in college, actually, that was like one of our assignments was to like pick a song and like um, and some like favorite lyrics and then translate that into a sculpture. So done it before. Definitely been influenced by music before, but it's not like my primary influence. Another question from our listeners. Do you start a piece with a clear concept or vision in mind, or does it emerge while you're working on the piece or some combo of, the, of both? I would say it's a combination. Yeah, like I, I wanna have a vision, like I wanna, if I come up with an idea, um, the most important thing to do is to actually like sketch it down and like, I feel like I'll like draw it out and, and maybe like marinate and think about it and really kind of like try to refine the idea some more. And I'll find that as I'm working on it, like once I start like working on it, sometimes those ideas kind of like, I feel like I give like, I process them a little more and they get a little more like refined and like, or like I'll be doing a thing and be like, ooh, there is the idea. Sometimes it's either like I will start with the idea or sometimes or start with the looser idea, and then the idea really like refines in the process. We definitely have a request to talk a little bit more about your pieces, um, ones that were featured earlier, and some of the ones behind you. Um, yeah. I know you've got you've got a fun extra piece. I know that you'd love to to show us. Um, it's a vegetable. I promise. Oh. Would you like to tell us a little bit um, about that piece, the materials that you used, because they are a different set of materials than you sometimes yeah. normally use. Yeah. Um, so the vegetable. <laughs> Well, I have this guy right here. So I have several of these. And so this is an eggplant, as you can see. And so this was born out of the idea of like talking with my friends. Like I have a group of online friends. So can you so, hold it up a little more? Yeah, there you go. There we go. So I have a group of online friends. And so like, we'll have like fun chats and stuff. And, um, you know, like you play around with the emojis and crack jokes and like you guys all know, right? You guys know what this means in a, an emoji format, right? And so it was a whole like tongue in cheek idea of like sucking on an eggplant and that's where the idea was born. <laughs> and um, I enjoy partaking in this um, <clears throat> substance that goes in here. And so like, that's where I got the idea is to make a pipe out of this. And so um, this was, this one in particular was made out of a uh, porcelain clay and was thrown on the wheel as a hollowed piece. So this was thrown all in one piece, including the stem. And then from there it was altered. And I just like poked a hole in here and poked a hole in here. And I actually made a little um, ceramic cone where our, I will press clay onto the cone and it will mimic that shape and form a bowl. And so then that bowl will get inserted into here um, and it's glazed from the inside. So it's actually easy to clean. Um, so I thought about all those details as a user, as one who partakes and, um, and just it's a fun idea. <laughs> <laughs> it is a lot of fun and very tongue-in-cheek. It is very tongue-in-cheek, yeah. Uh, some of the other pieces that you've got to, to feature, um, I love the llama that you've got. Um, would you like to tell us a little bit about your study in animal, uh, animal making? 
Sure. Um, I, well, I really love animals and I really, um, well, I have a bit of a background in like um, still art and like figure drawing and still life. I got a lot of like formal training in drawing like that. So I really enjoy like drawing animals and people. And so I, at the time in college, I was really into llamas. I have, um, when I was a child, my mom and dad took me to the Oakland Zoo and you know how they have a petting zoo there? Um, mm -hmm. We had this llama that I was petting his face and he was chewing on a snack and suddenly he like spat in my face. So I had this like spit of like food on my face and I was bawling and crying and I remembered that in college and made this llama as a result. So this llama, <laughs> He's just very stoic and he's very silly. And um, I had a dog who had these crooked ears that flopped over. And so it was just like, uh, like one day these llama ears kind of like fell down and I realized they looked like her ears exactly. So this was like a joint combination of like the llama memory and my dog. <laughs> yeah. A little mashup. A little mashup, yeah but still with like humor in it because like while I was very upset about the llama spitting in my face at the time I think it's hilarious now. It definitely makes for a good story. Yeah. <laughs> um, our last audience question that I've received, um, ceramics are sometimes seen as crafts and sometimes seen as art. What do you think differentiates the two? Um, I feel that with ceramics there's the craft of like refining like techniques and like making vessels and things that are more of like a functional pur pur purpose. But art, I ceramic art in particular, has a concept or idea that is trying to communicate and express to the viewer. And um, I feel like if it touches the viewer and connects with them in some way, that is successful art. Speaking on that a little bit, a prevalent theme in your work is female empowerment. It floats into a lot of your pieces. Um, we saw uh, you know, a vase that you created earlier that has some images of um, female body parts. Can you talk about female empowerment uh, and how it's influenced your work? Sure, yeah. So what I've had is like, so um, as a child, like, well, when I was young, um, I, I went through some, some things, as uh, many young girls do, as they're growing up, they may have gone through some, like, um, sexual encounters, and so, like, that really kind of affected me growing up, and I feel like this, the work that I make for female empowerment is kind of, like, um, I think I realized that when I was growing up, I felt like that power was taken away from me by what happened in the past and so like the work that I make now is taking that power back and and really kind of like embracing what I felt was that I was so ashamed of for years is to like really kind of like help me get over it and really kind of like embody like in embrace the change and like trying to move forward and really just taking back that power and I really kind of feel like a lot of women have gone through that and so for me, it's just really about like celebrating um, the the strength that we've gone through and like and, and really celebrating the, the differences in females and women bodies because like we're also very like trained that like women have to be in a particular like look a certain way, you know, that's like what society tells us. So it's really about like embracing different different like bodies, female bodies empowering yourself and really taking that power back that may have been taken from you. At least that's how I see it. It's a really incredible way of thinking about how to reclaim things that happened to us in our past and process through them in art. Mm -hmm. um, our director of marketing is going to uh, show us the picture of that vase again on our screen so we can all take a look. While we're looking at that um, image, could you tell us a little bit about the process uh, that you went through to make that piece? 
Sure. So um, that piece um, I made in school, and that was actually all wheel thrown, and it was thrown in three parts. And it's actually one of the few pieces that I have made in three parts. And um, the first part was like you're actually two bowls, and so excuse me. The first one is just like one placed upside up, thrown upright, and then the second one was a bowl that was thrown and then placed upside down, and so. The challenge in making this is that you have to make the rim of the second bowl fit to the first bowl. And so they may have to make sure that they both line up. And that can be really challenging. And even the like flipping of that piece that's thrown and very wet and soft and like you have to worry about it not, like squishing or falling off as you're test testing to make sure that they do align. And then um, the third part was just like a, a cylinder that was thrown hollow and just attached on the top. And so the female um, shapes that you see on there, those are all um, inspired by this one website that I found called the Labia Library. It's a website that has user submitted photos of um, their anatomy or their female anatomy. And it's meant to show the differences in women's body parts. And so I really, really enjoyed seeing that website and like having, and I would carve different individual like vaginas on there to kind of like celebrate like how different we are. And then um, I spent like a month of glaze testing of trying to get a certain color and consistency to kind of emulate bodily fluids and just really kind of like embrace the female um, genitalia. Thank you for sharing about that work. Mm -hmm. We are so appreciative of all the gorgeous artistry that you bring, the powerful stories that you share, and the incredible community and culture that you have developed at The Crucible. Um, what is it like for you to teach at The Crucible in the place where you were born and raised? Um, for me, it's like really coming full circle. So I just feel so, so fortunate and so grateful to to be able to go back into that community that I really really love like um, I don't live in Oakland now and I, and I miss it dearly and so I really would love to go back there because I just remember the community that was around us um, and just the the I have so many good memories of Oakland and I just really it just helps me like I don't know I feel very fulfilled and, and giving back to that community. And I just, it, I'm just so happy being there. It really, it's like so fulfilling. So pleased to be in Oakland. I remember when I very first started at the Crucible, one of the first people that I was welcomed by was you, Rosa. I think that I speak for everyone listening. You are one of the most warm and welcoming individuals uh, at the crucible and we are grateful to get to learn and be in your presence uh thank you rosa and thank you everyone who joined us for this week's virtual artist talk you can follow rosa on instagram at clay around the bay c-l-a-y around the bay you can also buy some of rosa's eggplant pipes at the crucible.org we have a space where people can buy gorgeous art made by all of our faculty and artists including including rosa's pieces um, we hope that you will come on back and join us next friday when we sit down and talk with glass blowing artist sam schumacher thank you so much for being here you'll get an invitation to that talk uh, next week if you are able we would love to have your help in supporting us navigate these choppy waters um, at the crucible if you are able to donate buy a gift certificate or join as a member. We would appreciate your support. And don't forget our matching grant all the way through May, 5th, uh, May 8th. You can donate and every dollar that's donated is doubled by our matching grant up to $50,000. So check out the crucible.org for all sorts of juicy information of ways that you can be part of our community as well. So um, we are going to wrap up our official talk with Rosa, um, but if you'd like, stay, stick around because we are going to shift into our artist talk after hours. 
where you can unmute and actually get a chance to ask some questions and say hello to our artist, Rosa. So with that, I'm going to say thank you. Enjoy your Friday. Stick around if you'd like. Be safe and be well.